the absolute commitment to truth, whatever that is, is essential. And that is like when we're auditioning for some of the VR series that I've, I've been working on, it's like, that is just the key. It's like, we have to believe this person a thousand percent. And that's why, you know, we work with just some of the most incredible, talented actors and actresses that, that we can in those spaces, because if you are BSing in any way or acting in any type of way, it just is so much more blaring and stands out so much more than on a traditional film. Because also you can kind of cut away from things in, you know, in a traditional film and television set where in, in VR, you don't know where the viewer is going to be looking, right? Because it's 360 degrees. So you can't ever really hide cuts in the same way that you could. There are ways, but it basically be thinking about it like you want to go into that as honest and real and just giving the truth as, as, as deeply and honestly as you can. Welcome to sag After Foundation's The Business Program. I'm Zoriana Kitt, sag After journalist and today's moderator. So now, without further ado, Pleasure to introduce to you, Director Elijah Allen Blitz. Hi, hi, welcome, welcome. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. So uh, we're here today to talk about um, auditioning in this VR, AR, virtual production space, um, what it's like to work within it, how different it is from traditional. But first, let's go over some uh, some key words. The words AR, VR, virtual production, these are things we keep hearing. More and more productions are employing this type of filmmaking, virtual production. Uh, it's been on shows such as Mandalorian, Star Trek, and the new Netflix series, 1899. Um, and you yourself, you have a short film out on Disney Plus called Remembering, starring Brie Larson. And the film also employed virtual production. So explain to our SAG AFTRA members what that means and where terms like VR and AR fit into that. Right on. So, yeah, they are all completely unique and separate things, basically, even though they are connected in some ways. But so let's start with VR. VR is stands for virtual reality. And that's when you put on a headset and you can think of Ready Player One and you are completely immersed in a virtual world. And so that's virtual reality. It's a you know 360 degree experience. Sometimes you have the ability to move forward and backwards, which they call six off, where you have six degrees of freedom. Uh, but that is virtual reality where you're completely immersed in another world. Uh, I've done a, a lot of those projects as well. And that the, 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 the creative process for that is a separate question than AR and the rest of them as well. They all have their own kind of like ways that we can talk about this. Uh, AR, augmented reality, you are looking through something like whether it's glasses or your phone, but you're seeing the real world through your device, glasses, phone, tablet, whatever that is. You can think of like Tony Stark in Iron Man or Minority Report because you're seeing the real world, except there's digital objects overlaid on top of it. So that's where it gets a little tricky because it's not so much about the complete immersion, but it's more about the interactivity. Uh, so that's augmented reality. And then virtual production, uh, it was what Zoriana was talking about with these giant stages. This is probably a harder one to explain because most people haven't seen it. And if you have had experience with it, that's awesome. And I highly recommend Googling it and, you know, getting familiar with it as possible, especially if you have an audition for something like that coming up. Um, but in my opinion, I'm also a SAG after member. And I think that that not only is the future, but as actors, you will appreciate it so much more. I appreciate it so much more as a director, even because you're not looking at blue screen or green screen. You're looking at a gigantic room with basically large televisions, except they're, you know, they're, they have move and motion blur and stuff. But it's like it's, I can show pictures because it's very hard to describe. But you're in, you see the environment that you're supposed to be imagining. So instead of saying, oh, there's a monster up there, like look at the, the tennis ball and pretend you'd be scared, you would actually see the monster on this gigantic 25 foot LED wall. Some of them are 360 degree spheres. Some of them are you know, 270, so they're like half circles. Um, it just depends on the stage. So that is virtual production. Um, so yeah, as we're going through this conversation, AR, VR, virtual production, they're different and they can all be used together. <laughs> Well, speaking of being used together, 
remembering your short film on Disney Plus comes with an AR component. So when people go to view it, they have the option to view it as is, which is a, a beautiful, beautiful story about uh, a, a woman or a girl who uh, lost her uh, childlike memory and and meets her former meets her younger self who walks her through the world of imagination and helps her get her imagination back. And viewers have the option of going to Disney Plus and there's a QR code next to the film there in the programming and they can download the app and they view they can view the film through their phones in a way where components of the film are coming out of their phone like uh, there's a waterfall coming out of the tv and and shrubs growing out of the couches so this is the first time that disney has released uh something on disney plus that comes with an ar component so um let's i guess let's talk about ar i mean you've you've won emmys in the world of vr and ar this is definitely your domain as someone who is also an actor, you understand what that entails if, if you're going to respond to a breakdown for a VR or AR or virtual production project. So um, let's let's pick one. Uh, let's do uh, uh, AR, for example. Uh, when something is on breakdowns for a project like that, what can an actor expect in the audition or how should they prepare? Is it just about learning your lines and that's it? Or is there more to that? So AR is different uh, in the respect that right now, most of the AR stuff, even what we did with Disney, is the, the virtual elements that come out of your screen. And by the way, that might sound very confusing for a lot of people. Like when Zoriana says, like, the stuff comes out of your television. I almost feel like I can just show you a little bit of something on my phone because it, it's really some of the stuff is not going to make sense unless you see it. So uh, this is just a screen recording from someone holding up their phone. I'm just going to hold this up so you guys can see it. Uh, you can see this. So this was just through, through screen recording through the phone. And so the stuff comes out of the TV and into your living room. Right. So I hope that gives you a better sense of what we're talking about with AR. That is not, you know, CG. This is totally real, just recorded through a phone. Um, so the audition process for AR, as of right now, until we get into like really photorealistic virtual humans, it's not that different than a traditional audition process, because mostly it's going to be CG characters implemented into your physical space. So it's 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 different. Um, the audition process for VR is different. Um, and then the audition process for uh, the virtual production, it's, it's something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, it, for AR, I, it's probably about the same. You, you guys just, you know, be prepared, do your thing. Cause it's, it's as of right now, until we cross this line into like digital humans, it's not really gonna affect that much. So basically you're saying that AR is right now being used as an enhancer for the project as a whole, as opposed to something specific that actors need to incorporate into their own acting. Exactly right. Okay. And so in what about VR? What about virtual reality when we have the headset on? Yes. Yes. So this is something that is actually very different. It's not different probably than what most acting teachers teach, but the reality is when you're in a virtual reality headset, you're because your peripheral vision is taken up, there's part of your brain that actually believes that what you're seeing is real. So you're not processing it like it's something that you're watching. You're processing it in some part of your brain like it's something you're experiencing. So bad acting in virtual reality feels like someone is lying to your face. It is really not good. So it, the the absolute commitment to truth, whatever that is, is essential. And that is like when we're auditioning for some of the VR series that I've, I've been working on, it's like that is just the key. It's like we have to believe this person a thousand percent. And that's why, you know, we work with just some of the most incredible, talented actors and actresses that, that we can in those spaces. Because if you are, you know, BSing in any way or acting in any type of way, it just is so much more blaring and stands out so much more than on a traditional film. And TV. Because also you can kind of cut away from things in, you know, in a traditional film and television set where in, in VR, you don't know where the viewer is going to be looking, right? Because it's 360 degrees. So you can't ever really hide cuts in the same way that you could. There are ways, but it basically be thinking about it like you want to go into that as honest and real and just giving the truth as, as, as deeply and honestly as you can. That would be my best advice for it because it really, 
if you, I, I, I recommend just get, you can get an Oculus on Amazon for, you know, a couple hundred bucks or even just any, any type of headset. They even have the Google cardboard ones you can put your phone in. But if you see an experience where there is an actor that is not performing very well or is acting, you really will feel the difference. It is not just like when you see something on TV and you're like, oh yeah, that's not good. It's like, whoa, what, what's happening? It really is almost like someone's, again, someone's lying to my face. So as a director who's sitting with a casting director and you're casting a project in that world, when you see the self tapes or when you do a Zoom audition or have the actors in the room reading something for you, what are you looking for, for from them or in them? I mean, obviously it depends on the role, right? I mean, that's the, the main thing, but it's really just that ability for truth, like where, where, I, where I'm looking at that person's eyes and they are, whatever they are saying, they are completely believing, they are committed to whatever it is that they're portraying. Like I'm, one of the things I'm thinking of is, is uh, the project that we won an Emmy for was a series called The Messy Truth. And it, there was an episode, it was with uh, Brie Larson that was in it and it was about sexual harassment. And we had to cast the manager of the restaurant who kind of, he doesn't it, like overtly sexually harass the viewer, but it's like these microaggressions. And so to be able to find someone that is that embodies that feels that can go there in that way, it was like essential. It, what, we could not cut any corners. We could not start filming until we found that person that we nailed it and believed a hundred percent because if not everybody else, even if, you know, Bree's killing it, everybody else is doing their job. The camera looks great. It doesn't matter if one of the characters is dropping the ball it ruins the entire experience. Got it. So let's turn to virtual production, which is how Remembering was shot. So as you said, it, it's, it's shot on a curved screen with giant LED lights. And instead of a green screen, and instead of actors having to imagine an object there, it is there for them in real time. And so they are acting opposite something that is very real in that moment that's not put into VFX later. So they know exactly what it's going to look like on the final product once the film is out or the TV show is out. And they have a sparring par partner in this yeah. case, which is not a tennis ball. So um, your actors, have they had they worked in this space before? Was it their, and if it was their first time, describe their feeling of having arrived onto the remembering set in the virtual production studio and, and what that was like for them. Well, so remembering was very unique because we cast a, a child that was really the star of the show and she was not an actress. She was actually our next door neighbor. And she, you know, we, we wanted to, the reason we had to create this in a, in a virtual environment, because if we just threw onto a giant blue screen, we're like, imagine this. It's like she, her reactions just would have been like, uh, they wouldn't have been authentic. So when we, what we did was we created this entire world. We never even called action once with her. This is a very specific, you, you know, example. But like with this little girl, we never called action. We just like let her react to what was happening around her. And we would kind of talk and like some sometimes feed her lines or just hear what she had to say, but letting her react to the environment. Because also with the virtual production, I can show you some pictures. The It's not just about the LED walls, but it's also because there is a physical set dressing involved in the middle of this. So there is physical elements incorporated and hopefully seamlessly blended with the digital environments. And that's key to be allowing them to like act actively do whatever they feel like, pick up grass, throw this thing, play around. But instead of being surrounded by a bunch of blue, you're surrounded by a real CG environment. So you're having stuff to interact with, not just play with in your imagination, but also something to, to react off of that you see. Oh, it's like, instead of, oh, there's a waterfall over there. It's like, I'm looking at the waterfall. There's a unicorn right there. You know, this is in the case of remembering if you haven't got to see it yet. It's all about the world of imagination. So that there are unicorns. <laughs> and and I imagine during during the casting process for that, it, it's not essential to there's uh, to to be virtual production specific in the audition process because you're casting an actor, whether it's green screen or or an LED screen, right? It's it's the audition process is the same. Yes, it, it is the same. And actually, though, I will give you guys kind of a, a tip that these stages are not perfect yet. <laughs> They're getting better. I've just shot something uh, recently and it's like a lot better than it was a year ago. But just so you know, these stages will fail at times and they'll suddenly crap out. And all of a sudden they might in the middle of the shoot have to be like, all right, we're just going to go to blue screen. 
stuff does happen. As you guys know, stuff happens on set that are not, that is not planned for. So uh, always being aware that at any moment you might have to revert into your imagination. So having a clear image of what you're looking at can be helpful, but then remember that image because if something did happen and we have to go to blue screen, uh, just keeping that in mind, I think could be very helpful. As a director, do you find that uh, lighting a virtual production set is a lot different because those LED screens are emanating so much light already that you, al you already have this whole other light source automatically there? Oh, yeah, it's, it's ideal. It's, I, I just shot a car commercial on a LED screen. It was just for the reflections on the car. It was ideal. It's like you don't have to worry about like perfecting all this stuff. And even yeah, even with remembering, it was like just, you know, we, we shot this nighttime scene in this forest. It was like an impossible forest. But because all the lighting was pretty much in place, it was so minimal what we actually had to use on set to try and match whatever was going to be done in post because it's already there on the set. Do you find that uh, hair or makeup or uh, clothing, do you, is there a different type of reflection from those lights that can affect an actor's look? Well, you know, so it really uh, was pioneered by the Mandalorian. And, and they, they did it because the Mandalorian suit was obviously all very reflective. And so that was a big part of why they wanted to shoot the whole thing on the virtual production stages, because everything was reflective. So that is, it really depends on the costume, but that, that really is a, is a key component of, of why this stuff is so helpful because you don't have to go in and adding reflections and posts it just can take forever and it can look really terrible if you don't do it right. So being able to have real reflections on the day, on whatever, whatever it is, makes such a big difference. And, and again, just, um, as, as talking to actors, it's like, you know, you're going to have something that you're really looking at, not just having to imagine and pretend like, oh, OK, yeah, I think there's a thing here and it looks like this. It's like, oh, I'm looking at it. Do you find that as a director, when you're directing actors, that is there a general is sense of ease or do things go faster in that type of setting? Or is it just like any other set? It just has its ups and downs and it's just another day of shooting. I personally and this could just be my own experience. I, I feel like it does help everybody. And I think it makes everything not just go faster, but it makes everyone more engaged because we're all on the same page. Like every single person on set, crew and cast, we're all looking at the same thing, right? We're not like looking behind the lens and being like, oh, it's going to look like this. What we're looking at through the lens is what it's going to look like. I mean, maybe we'll add a little bit of fairy dust here and there, but really it's like what you're looking at is pretty close to the final image. Like ideally, you know, it's getting more and more, but you know, ideally you're looking at 90% of the final image. So basically everyone's on the same page and it's, it's, it's an entire group thing happening together. So you're all marching towards a final goal, which just makes it a more cohesive expedited set. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, it, listen, it's, that's what we love about making movies, right? It's the most collaborative medium in the world. And so we all not only get to collaborate, but we get to be much more on the same page because we're looking at the same thing. Yeah. You don't have to be like, oh, well, makeup people, just picture yeah. this when you do her right. makeup or a oh, wardrobe, then this this thing is going to shine on her. And then, yeah. you know, just do that. So like everyone sees it. It's happening in <laughs> real time right there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So how did you get into this type of uh, world? I mean, uh, is it something that you just you direct a little bit and then you fall into this tech world or were you always interested in tech? It was I was at the TED conference in 2015 and I saw a VR experience and it wasn't like, oh, that specific one is the greatest thing ever. But it was like I could see that this is going to be part of the future. And so I had the opportunity to work on a project later that year. And it just kind of became like a snowball effect. People started saying, oh, you do VR and you do VR. And I started I got to work with Ken Burns on a, a piece about the Holocaust. Uh, you know, I worked with Laird Hamilton, the big wave surfer on, on a piece for, for his uh, documentary. You know, I've been working with Ben Jones on this series about empathy with Marvel actors. Um, I've just the, the universe kind of just said, like, you're supposed to be doing this for right now. So the, the merging of the technology and the storytelling, but always at the heart coming back to the story for me is it, just something that I've, I've always been passionate about. I just it's not like I've, I was like, oh, I'm going to do VR. It was like I want to use all the technological tools at my disposal to create and tell the best story possible. So basically, you view virtual production as a as a 
as one technique? Because I, I imagine that not everything is suitable to be shot in this capacity. Some okay. days you really want to be in an actual forest with actual sunlight, as opposed to recreating that on a screen. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's not it's not like, oh, everything needs to be on an LED wall. But at the same time, it's like I would way rather do that than blue screen, you know. But if we can go to a forest, yeah, let's go to a forest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are some of the challenges in, wor in working in that type of controlled environment? Because I, to me, it feels like there's a lot of pluses. You can control the weather. So you never get rained out because you control the rain. It's magic hour every hour. You can control the sunset. And if you need to have the sunset fall down beautifully 10 different times to shoot it 10 different ways, you can do that. It's not you have one shot on that Wednesday and then you all have to come back the next day. Are there any, is, like, is there a downside or a chat, like difficulties in shooting in this that you don't get in traditional filmmaking? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, technological downsides uh, where, you know, you it basically instead of having all the time at the end where you build the stuff in post-production, you have to build everything in pre-production. So you have to go into it with pretty much your world pretty much set. So there's that constraint. Uh, it costs more as of right now. I think the price is coming down, but it does cost more to shoot on the the, the stages. And then also, like I said, stages do break and, and learn, you know, they crap out like stuff happens. And so, you know, you always got to be kind of prepared for that, that it, you, we, we are do, we're utilizing technology that is at the forefront. And it's some of this has never been done before. So it's like you always have to be aware that, you know, if you're on the cutting edge stuff, you might fall off the edge at some point. So just being aware that, you know, things are going to happen. It's 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 you know, there, there there's always downsides. But at the same time. To me, it, the, the pros outweigh the cons when it comes to virtual production versus blue screen by a lot. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose, you know, because it's technical, you know, lights do burn out. Uh, the uh, electricity does cut out and all those little modern day, modern world gadgets that we have, you know, that like you said, they do fail and uh, a technician may be required to come in and do some repair work. Whereas when you're out in mother nature, it, you know, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, what, one thing, this is interesting, and I've been trying to say this to a lot of my crew when we've been doing some virtual production stuff, is, and this actually might be helpful for actors, have a pair of blue light blocking glasses just like in your back pocket because the, the, the walls, depending on what stage you're shooting at, they are enormous and they are bright. And if you're in there all day, it can be very overwhelming. So maybe just like I, I started wearing a pair of blue light blocking glasses and I noticed that my head hurt less <laughs> after a day of shooting on the volume. So that's something I mean, I don't know the research behind it, if that really makes a big difference, but I felt like that did make a little bit of a difference. So I would say maybe just a side tip, ha have some blue light blocking glasses just in case your head starts hurting, because it is a lot of lights. And I can show you, uh, you know, some of these pictures, you can get a better idea for what we're talking yeah. about. But yeah, it, it's a lot of lights. One of the things about working in virtual production is like you said, you everything happened, pre-production happens, post-production is pre-production is what I mean to say. Like you, 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 you will never say, oh, we'll fix it in post <laughs> because you actually create it in pre and then that prevents you having to fix anything in post. So yes, a lot of that work is done ahead of time. But that also means that as a director, when you show up on set on day one, it's plug and play for you because you've you've prepared so much ahead of time, correct? Pretty much. I mean, there's always, you know, things to be taken into consideration and you always got to say, but, but overall, the answer is yes. I mean, there, there, there's always going to be stuff that happens on set and that you can't take into account. But overall, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot more plug and play, especially if you've done your job and you're prepared and your whole team is ready and you've tested this. I, you know, that's something that, you know, I, I've always baked in extra two days to pre-light, pre-set everything. And, and so that's an important part. And, and you talked about the collaboration and the uh, how everyone's on the same page because they see the same image. I also imagine that the type of collaboration that's happening in pre-production between departments is unlike anything that happens 
and traditional where a lot of departments are segregated and they don't cross collaborate, but here they have to because the props people have to work with the production designer who has to work with the cinematographer to make sure that you're all going towards that goal of, of, of what you have seen in camera, correct? It's exactly right. It's, you know, the, the production designer is, is like becomes so much more of an essential piece. It's not just like, oh, we're going to match whatever you did on your production design to the blue screen. It's like, no, we got to make sure that what you're doing, you see the image up against the wall and we have to make sure that that blends seamlessly into the set. Yes. And the cinematographer who loves working with the lights and deals with light sources also has to take into consideration the LED source that's coming at him as a also as a as a lighting factor too. It's almost it it kind of goes back to that old Hollywood era of filmmaking where like the MGM studios would have like a backdrop that would come down and yeah. and the, the scenery was there because they didn't have green screens back then. Green screens came green screens and blue screens came along later. And with virtual production, it's like we're returning back to that original way of filmmaking with all of the departments on the set working together. We, we actually did exactly that, almost as like a throwback. For There's a scene in Remembering where uh, Bree's inner cabin writing and the, the outside windows, we actually, what we did was we took the, the giant digital images from the LED wall and we printed them out on enormous 25 foot pieces of canvas and put them and lit them outside of the cabin. So instead of making it digital, it was actually a trans light, like you're saying, like we used to do in old Hollywood. And it's like, it was that same idea. So we actually did literally that because this is just the next version of that. Yes. Well, I, I'm going to go through some of the questions that I already have here from uh, some of the actors here. Um, the first one is where to find casting calls for virtual reality acting jobs. Uh, I'm assuming it's all on breakdown or is there some secret side world for that? I don't know his answer. I, every, every project that I've done is, is, has been different in, in the VR space because it's, it's all, it's a very new uh, landscape. Everyone says it's the Wild West, which has been way overused, that term. Uh, but but it, it, really, it, it really is the case that there are no rules yet because uh, VR content, the funding for VR content is not really established of how it goes. So I, I, I can't give a clear answer because it's every project I've done has been a different casting process. Got it. So it can be found in, in, in VR. traditional ways on yeah. breakdown services and yeah. all of that, actors access and stuff like that, right? Yeah, for and sure. Another question is, what do you think are the biggest changes coming in VR, AR for actors in 2023, whether it's the equipment and the tech or some of the industry standards that will have to change uh, because of this new technology? I don't think anything's going to happen that fast. I don't think it's going to be like next year. We're all going to be really affected by it. There's going to be drastic changes, but the things to keep an eye on is, is really getting comfortable in either mocap suits or uh, virtual production stages, you know, where they're going to do like 3d holographic scans. Um, you know, I know on uh, almost all the big movies now they do, uh, 360 scans of the actors at the end of every day. That's just built into the contract because they can do slight manipulations to their face or their body. It's like, oh, we wish that the arm was up. And instead of having to go to reshoots, they just like digitally lift the arm up. So be prepared that like that's going to be happening more and more. Uh, that you're you're gonna have to you're gonna be requested. It'll be in your contract to like your some digital copy of yourself is going to be owned by a studio. Another question is. So says my current reps rarely get roles like these across their desk. They recommend I reach out to agents who specialize in this arena. Do you recommend any agents that specialize? Are there agents that specialize in this arena in any way? I mean, as far as I know, all, all the big agencies have AR, VR, I mean, not really AR, like I said, it's more VR. They all have VR departments. You know, there, there is like somebody that runs the metaverse at CAA or WME, like they all have versions of that. So I don't think that as far as I know, I mean, you know, it could be different with different agencies, but it, 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 the big agencies all have divisions that are focused on this stuff. Yeah, that's what, that's what I would think too. Um, uh, which genres of film do you think 
will be most popular for VR and AR? So for VR, I think it's going to be very hardware dependent. Uh, I think that it's going to be like once the, because nobody, the, the headsets right now are pretty big and bulky and it's not really there. Um, but once it does get there, I think it's going to, there's going to be a whole new kind of genre of films where, where it is much more experiential, choose your own adventure, immersive inside of a, a VR headset. Um, but again, that's, that's further down the line for, uh, you know, AR stuff. I do see that probably in the next year, uh, there will be some company is going to come out with some sort of glasses. And that's going to change a lot because right now, you know, with remembering you hold your phone or your iPad up to the TV and you have this experience where, the, you know, it comes out of the television through your device. But theaters don't want that. They don't want you holding up a phone or an iPad in the middle of the theater because that distracts everybody else. But if you have glasses like 3D glasses, except these are AR glasses. That is a very different and unique experience because then everybody can be having their own individual experience while watching this film. So, you know, it, instead of just like 3D, the thing is coming out, flying around you. You can maybe even interact with it to some degree. Um, so I do feel like that will change the landscape and the way that we tell stories uh, in the more near future than VR potential. For me personally, as someone who works in that space, the the common... Um, the, the common genres that I have seen that like to employ virtual production are, are space shows, otherworldly types of shows, because um, virtual production in, in, in this world building, creating distant planets and sci-fi worlds really lends itself to that format because you can, you can really build those worlds out and put them on that screen. So it's no surprise that shows like The Mandalorian or Star Trek Strange New Worlds or Star Trek Discovery use this technology because they are able to create these planets and uh, you don't have to build, you don't have to build a set, shoot it, and then have to destroy it at the end of each season and only to rebuild it again when, you know, it's time for season five. And by having these digital sets on there, you can keep visiting these same worlds. So sci-fi has been definitely, uh, uh, has seen uh, an uptick uh, in uh, virtual production use. But uh, do you see other genres? I mean, does it lend itself to horror movies? Does it lend itself to romantic comedies, perhaps? Maybe. I mean, really, like you said, if you if you want a golden hour every every hour, you know, it could work for a romantic comedy. Um, you yeah. know, if for for horror movies, for sure. Depending on on what the if it's more like a Stranger Things kind of thing, then yeah, I think that that would be very helpful. I know that they used it on I think the last episode of the last season of Westworld. You know, so it's just yeah, it really the the virtual production. I do see because especially with, you know, exponential technology and just doubling every 18 months, it's like it's just going to get more and more powerful and, and less and less expensive. So that is going to be more and more the norm, um, you know, AR, VR, different conversations, but the, definitely the virtual productions, that's something to get yeah. as familiar with as possible. In the commercial world, I also find that uh, car commercials love using this because you don't have to worry about, you don't have to drive down a desert road over and over and over again. You have the car in the studio and you have the road behind. And then you also don't have to worry about looky loose like it's like if you're launching a brand new you know lexus five point whatever and you're trying to keep it a secret because you're not going to launch it till the following year by having it in this controlled environment you, you know you can you can keep that model a secret before the unveiling and also the car doesn't get damaged by the elements uh the sand or the water or the dust and you can also control that and then like you said the reflections are so beautiful that uh, uh, I do find that many, many car companies are turning to virtual production, especially for car commercials. Is that your experience as well? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, to me, it's it, that that is like a no brainer, not just the reflection, but also the fact that because what, what we did on the last commercial I, I did, for, uh, it was a Nissan commercial that just came out. It, we filmed the entire we would go to the, the the different landscapes and we would film it with a 12k resolution 360 degree camera so the vr camera uh but it's in 12k not you know 4k not 8k 12k so it's an incredibly high resolution and then we'd film those and then we'd put them up on the volume so you'd be able to have then we'd have like 
you know, we could just rotate between eight different sets, have the star of the commercial sitting in the car, driving, just switch out the background, switch out the wardrobe and like, you know, blow some wind, do whatever magic we got to do. And you're, you're there basically, you know, that's an oversimplification, but it's, 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 it's that. Yes. Yeah. But also uh, as an advantage to the production is you don't have to seek out permits too. You don't have to be like, Oh, we need to rent out this national park to showcase the Jeep in this setting, you know? So it eliminates having to go through all that permit brouhaha. And it's also sure. the carbon footprint. I mean, it's environmentally sound because you're not building sets and then destroying them. You, everything is digital. And so it's just so much uh, easier uh, on the environment to not have all this waste because let's face it, you know, productions can, can be very wasteful. You're constantly building things and you don't, you don't store them for the next production because it's a one-off you, you do that car commercial. It's not like you're going to be reusing those sets later down the line. It was done specifically for the car commercial. So sets get destroyed. They end up in a landfill or, or whatnot, but the fact that it gets to be digital means there literally is no waste. So it's also a very environmentally friendly as well. I mean, come on, you didn't have to, you know, you shot this movie remembering and, you know, there was, there was just woods and leaves and grass and all this beautiful lush stuff that you guys created in virtual production. And you didn't damage a single tree or blade of grass in the making of that movie. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. So uh, next question is theatrical training yeah. important for VR or AR does casting look at theater as a plus for booking actors? I personally would take, you know, any theatrical experience into consideration. But to me, again, with VR specifically, it comes about how much you can just really be real and tell the truth. In theater, I know you have to project to get to the audience. And like this, it's not only like you, you know, scale it down like you've always heard with film. It's like it's just like right here with the camera. This is even more of a degree of like you are right there. You are looking at another person in the eyes, the viewer in this case, and you just have to tell the truth. So no exaggeration, nothing over the top, just the truth. I, I mean, I don't know how to say it more simply than that. And I know that's, it's not, it's easy to say it's harder to do, but that is really the key. Just be you. Just be just, you. Just, well, just be real. Yeah, whatever that is. Be that, be that character, be the truth. Because if you're exaggerating, if you're doing something over the top, like it's just going to, it just does not work in VR. Yeah. There'll be no soap operas in VR, I take it. <laughs> Probably not, unless it's like intended to be a joke like that. Yeah, probably. probably yeah. We're not going to do Cal California. The, the the Californians from SNL would never ever fly on uh, in VR because. <laughs> hey, I can't say never. I can't say never. But I would not at least for what I've been working on. No. Yeah. Um, does an actor need to set up a self tape audi audition differently for a virtual setting? No. Oh, uh, wait for like VR. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. It, it, it's just about the, the quality of, of the actor. Okay. Uh, this question right here, I, I, I'm going to read it, but I'm not sure I quite understand it. Um, in VR AR, are you less or more likely for rush calls? Sorry, I don't understand it either. I, I'm assuming rush calls is that like last last minute calls or last minute casting i'm i'm not sure i i yeah how uh, if, it, if it's last minute casting I, I i would say not on you know a, a, any of the projects i've been working on it's like you really have to be you know it's it's like we have everything prepared we know when we're shooting it's not like we're just going to rush and i mean it's, again stuff happens on set but we're, you know it, no it's not going to rush i mean but again it depends on the project because if it's a low budget project and they're like oh we just got the money let's shoot tomorrow you know that might happen yeah got it. so did, so does this format does vr or ar or virtual production usually lend itself to auditions with a tight turnaround or 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 is it really like you're planning everything in pre-production and that's usually it's usually not oh we need someone for tomorrow right not in your yeah. world that, that's been my experience. It, it has to be pretty meticulously planned out. Yeah. Well, which brings me to a question is once you have cast your actors for these projects, how soon do you start working with them and how much advance work needs to be done before the actual 
start of production? Well, it, it depends on the actor and it depends on the situation. Like, it's like, you know, working with Brie, like there's no, there's no rehearsal needed. It's like, she's going to come in and she's going to nail it on the first take. And you know, it's that, that's that. But uh, you know, with some of the other actors, like, you know, we, we would, we would definitely do rehearsals. It, it really depends on people's availability, but um, for, if we have the time to rehearse, I've always found it to be better, especially for um, the messy truth series that we were doing with Van Jones, because they're all uh, one shot. So there's no cuts in that. So it's like, it, it has to be kind of like a play where it just kind of like unfolds. And, you know, if somebody messes up, we have to just restart. So the, the, you know, I, I know that there can be some sort of spontaneity lost in that, but it's, it's more important to make sure that everybody is totally dialed in uh, before we start shooting that. So it's like choreographing a dance. You really need everyone to know their, their place in, in that shot. Yeah. 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 It, you know, with, with, of course, it being open to, that dance changing on set, but yeah. Yes, yes. The bottom line is we all have to be open to if the yeah. electricity fails, if the lights don't work, if the blue screen has to come on. I mean, I think I think uh, as filmmakers and actors, we we all have to learn to adapt at a moment's uh, notice because it's inevitable. Something will go wrong, and it usually <laughs> does. Um, what does the future look like in terms of your VR uh, AR career? What's next? You said you directed this car commercial. Um, do you have any plans in doing something in expanding the world of remembering, uh, perhaps? Or are you working on other projects? Yeah, um, so definitely uh, you know, trying to talk with Disney and figure out what they want to do with remembering, make it either whether that's making it a feature or turning it into a series about you know other different creatives and where their ideas come from. Uh, so we are exploring that. Um, there, there's also uh, there's a show that I'm, I'm working on about the life of Ramdas, the spiritual teacher um, that does actually have uh, an augmented reality uh, AR VR kind of component for every psychedelic trip. Um, I, I can't say too much about that, but we are, we are definitely, um, exploring that route more. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, there, there's uh, the messy truth, the, the series with, with Van Jones, it's, you know, it's, it's going to, that hopefully will go on forever. That's designed to be a curriculum for empathy. So we we have a, a episode with Zoe Saldana that we're working on next. That's going to be about homelessness. Uh, we're, we're talking with Josh Brolin about doing one about PTSD with veterans. Um, it's just, yeah, it, it, but I, ideally it's, it's, you know, hopefully there'll be hundreds of those eventually because it's just to show people from all different walks of life what it's like to see from someone else's perspective and so uh it sounds like to me that that uh, this type of technology has multi-uses not just film not just the film and television industry i mean you're you're using this as an educational component as well i'm sure there's there can be a medical component there can be a scientific component there can be you know political component there could be all types of components to this technology absolutely and vr has has already done that i mean they, they would take vr experiences to the un you know and do stuff about uh the syrian refugee crisis um there, there's so many different ways to use virtual reality and like i said once the technology gets better and that to a, a place where you know we can all feel like it's much more accessible i think that that's really going to change a lot of different industries what do you love most about this industry? I love I love making movies and telling cool stories that I really care about, you know. And it's like it, it, utilizing technology to just advance the storytelling. That's that's what matters to me. It's like how can we do the coolest thing that is in service of whatever the story is that we're telling. And the story is obviously always something that I'm super passionate about because it just takes that kind of like persistence to make stuff. <laughs> period. <laughs> So let's get back to, so speaking of stories, let's go back to remembering and tell the SAG after members really quickly in a nutshell what it's about. And, and then tell me, did you intend for this project to be shot in this way? Um, or, you know, like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did you have a story and, and just said, oh, I really want to do this. And, oh, I think it's best served in this format. Or did you say, I really want to do a story in this format. Let me write something that fits into it. Well, so there's actually two, two parts to that. So with remembering itself, uh, it was a story that we came up with during the pandemic. So it was just like, we were just going to shoot it in our backyard and it was just, you know, 
it, it was like something sweet just to stay creative. And it was an exploration of where ideas come from, really inspired by the work of Elizabeth Gilbert. And just that ideas are not something that come from us. There's something that come to us. And so exploring what that looks like, where do they go and we forget them? Uh, you know, what is that creative essence that we all have inside of us? In this case, it's represented by your, your inner child. Um, so I wrote this script and uh, then uh, we were, again, we were going to shoot it in our backyard and, and I uh, was connected with Disney and they reached out and they said, you know, what are you working on? And I said, oh, I have this little script we're going to do. And they're like, oh, we're interested. And all of a sudden it morphed into this much bigger thing than our backyard and it was like oh well let's use virtual production if we built the sets then like little girl can react off of it and all this stuff um so that part that's the story of how that came first but with the ar component that is actually different i've had that idea for about six years and i've been trying to push that forward and say like this is the future this is part of how we're going to interact with entertainment as humanity as and, and and so everyone was said no that's not possible it's not the way it works it's not you know it's not there yet and I, I'm just, I, I, you've heard me say this, but I'm, I'm dyslexic. So when I hear no, it means on. So I've just been persistent and just continuously just going and trying to figure out, I, I know that this is there and I know that the opportunity is out there and I know that it's possible. And so we put, were able to push this forward, get this done. And we actually did it before Facebook changed its name to Meta. So as soon as that happens, then everybody's like, oh, Metaverse, what do you got this Metaverse? And it was like, oh, well, actually, the only thing we have is this little short, you know, that they did like almost as an experiment. So that's uh, that's kind of how that came to be and got, you know, as large of a release in the, the platform and the, the attention that it's getting. And also, because it is the first of its kind ever been done. It's the first time that an uh, in AR image was triggered off a moving image on your television. And then... To also, we use the Shazam kit, so it also picks up on the audio to trigger the cues. Anyway, I don't want to get technically into the weeds about how we did all that. But with the AR stuff, I've been thinking about it for a while, not necessarily for this story, but this story came about like in a very simple way and then became a much bigger thing. So um, is it possible for you to bring up some of the images that you have just yeah. to get uh, the members here on this uh, on this call, uh, just some visuals and maybe you can talk over it and just sort of explain so that we can see the stage and what that looked like? For sure. Yeah. So, it, 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 you know, we've been talking about this. It's, it's very difficult to to tell you about it and it's way easier to just show you about it. So that is the stage. You know, can't really get a scope of it here. But I, I don't know how many or if any of you guys have gotten to see Remembering. It's on Disney Plus now. Um, but it's uh, so this was this bluff sequence where the little girl is sitting on the bluff when we first kind of enter the world of imagination. Um, but you can see, you know, like this, you can't get a scope of how big this room is. But this is an enormous bluff sitting uh, on the stage. Um, here we were, we, we were testing what it looked like to put up a, a blue wall because we were just getting a color reference. But if you can see in the you know background behind there on the left of the image, like that forest was what was really behind there. But you also can see the practical physical set dressing. Like that cabin is real. That was a real cabin that we built on the stage. Um, and kind of scroll through these, same thing that this is what it actually, you know, can look like after we finished the blue test. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions about any of these images, I can, you know, keep, yeah. But, but it, but, it really illustrates how, you know, the actor, it, you know, if they're working in front of that house and shooting a scene out, outdoors, you know, they might be told, hey, this is seven o'clock in the morning. And so adjust your acting accordingly or, oh, no, this scene takes place seven o'clock at night. Adjust your acting accordingly. Yes. But here they see yeah. it. They know the time of day. They see the light. They see the where they are. And so the acting uh, is it comes it comes across more innately because you're relying less on your imagination and more on interaction with the elements that that are there exactly right and i'm going to try and find one let's see oh yeah you can get a sense here of how big the stage is so if i zoom in you can see you know brie and the little girl dusty like in there um but that it's it's a it's an enormous stage and actually the stage uh, what you're only seeing is really half of it right there because they have extra panels so you can enclose the entire thing in 360 degrees, which is great for, again, car commercials because you have the reflection coming from all sides. Wow, that's incredible. And you can see how the, the light source, the screen itself is a light source, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we threw up, you know, this little, like, you can see the fake sun up in the corner there, even though it's like, because that wasn't in the shop, but we used that extra light to have that there. And you also have a ceiling that 
reflects that as well. And, yes. And so yes. maybe explain to uh, the actors on this, wh why do we, because we don't see, in the shot that we're looking at, you know, we see Dusty and Bree, but we don't see the sky, we don't see the sky up ahead. So why do you need the same thing on, on a ceiling as well? Well, oh, the, the lighting. And, and a lot of stages actually don't have a ceiling. Uh, and, and that's that can be a problem because like then you do have to light it and you have to set up a bunch of you know different external light sources and get that whole thing going but really the the ceiling makes a huge difference and if you look in the upper left hand corner you can see this kind of pink strip and that was to kind of uh, help just you can throw up these light cards anywhere you want on the stage and so that little pink strip was just kind of helping give some highlights to, to the shape of the scene but you can see like there's physical objects planted in there as well as, as the digital. And that's really, to me, that's the key is you have to blend the physical and the digital or else it's just going to look like a blue screen environment, even though it's, you know, a virtual world. So the actors on set, do they need to be aware of anything when they are on the set? I mean, can they help somehow, can they help you do your job in any way uh, what, to make it just easier for you? Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's just as, you know, traditional, just be, just be as prepared as possible. You know, yeah. it, 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 it's, it's like, hopefully we're just helping the actors, you know, it's, it's not really like, because we're on shoot, shooting on an LED volume, you, you know, actors need to do something different. Hopefully we're creating an environment that's easier for them to feel like they're in the world that they're inhabiting. Yes. And uh, I, I think and, there's and, one more picture. Yeah, okay. absolutely. No, whatever images you have are great. And they're um, they're very fascinating. I mean, this is just more of the shots, but you get the idea of, of the scope of the stage and how big it is. And, yeah. and and also the you can't really tell here, but like the camera focuses on a, on just the narrow angle of what's in the frame. So you don't have to like process the entire stage. It's such a high resolution because there's so much volume going through it. And so uh Again, you can't really tell in this image, but uh, the, the camera is just really put into the highest resolution on the wall, what is in the frame. So if you move the camera, that rectangle of what's in the frame just continuously gets higher resolution, where the, the parts that are not in the shot are not as high resolution to yeah. save bandwidth on the stage. But you can understand, seeing these images, you can understand how a show like, you know, Mandalorian or Star Trek would would want to create worlds in a space like this because you can have a desert and have it stretch out as far as the eye can see, right? And yes. and uh, or you can have a planet, planets, multiple planets that you know you can land on and then walk through. And so it really, you really do get a sense of the kind of controlled lighting that you can get and the kind of worlds that you can create with uh, with this technology. A couple more questions before. Before we wrap it up, do you have any sources you recommend to follow VR and AR news? Are there cool websites that you like? Um, are there um, uh, any magazines? There's a great one called VR Scout that's been around uh, for a long time, and they've been they've been covering this stuff. But really, I would recommend like just going if you go on Apple News and just like you know tag AR or VR. Just you're going to get the best, you know, images that that I mean, sorry, the best articles that come up because really they run the gamut. It's there. There are some, uh, you know, magazines like VR Scout that really focus on that stuff. But if, if you just, you know, make that as one of your like preferred searches, you can just see daily like what what are the new things that are coming out? Because it, it's something actually that is important to stay on top of that because there's always new things coming out. Like when I did this this last Nissan commercial, I was telling them I was like, oh, yeah, there's a 12K camera that will shoot. <clears throat> with a high enough resolution that we can put up on this 25 foot volume and the production company is like, no, that's not possible. It doesn't exist. And I said, yes, it does. Let me show you, <laughs> you know, because I, I have a relationship with the, you know, the camera houses. And so I know this stuff that isn't released yet, but by staying on top of all that stuff, you can be more prepared. I mean, that's for me and what I do in my specific medium, but like we, we got to show uh, Steven Spielberg remembering before it came out. And he was talking about how he had wanted to do something like this for ready player one. And he, he's very into the AR space. And what he talked about, it was like the contact lenses, like not just glasses, but contact lenses where you would be able to see your own environment but with overlays of, you know, virtual uh, objects in, in front of you, just like we we're talking about with, you know, Tony Stark and Iron Man. Um, so just being aware that stuff like that is coming, how it affects your specific craft, you know, you have to kind of figure that out. But it's good to know that this is all part of what is coming down the line. 
I'm I'm actually also going to throw in a, a source for um, for the actors that are on here and for yeah. the person who asked this question. What we didn't talk about was uh, these uh, the 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 stuff that's inside the on the screen on the LED screens on these sets is powered by video game engines. So if you play video games. Uh, I mean, Elijah, I'll let you describe that part and then I'll get back to what I was saying. So to tell tell them real quick how um, how the uh, video game engine powers these sets. Yeah, I mean, that, so that entire wall that you saw was built inside the game engine of, of Unreal. And so we were able to then take those same assets and put them into Unity, uh, which is another game engine, and utilize those same assets for the, the AR experience in the, in the short. But yeah, uh, Zorian is completely correct. They're all powered by these different game engines. So like, you know, Epic Games owns Unreal and it's, you know, it, it, it's all what makes most of the video games that you play. Yes. So getting back to piggybacking on that, if you, uh, uh, the game engines that work for virtual production like Epic Games and Unity, which uh, by the way, Unity bought Weta, which is, you know, they make all the Lord of the Rings movies, but th those two game engines, have a lot of um, making of behind the scenes videos on their websites. And both of them, especially Epic Games, um, they're, they're, they have a big educational component because they also, like Elijah and I, they really are passionate in spreading virtual production to as many people as possible. And for those who are interested in working behind the scenes in this kind of technique, um, Epic Games and its Unreal Engine, they offer a lot of courses free of charge to get people uh, acclimated to, to that genre. So um, if you're looking for more information for this, I would definitely check out um, Epic Games, their website. Um, I'm more familiar with them than I am with Unity, but I imagine Unity does the same thing. And that would also be a great way to educate yourself and get yourself up to speed on the technology because whatever is brand new coming out, the game engines will have them because they're the ones doing the R&D uh, that further the technology. So definitely um, check out the game engines for that. And last but not least, Elijah, do you think some of the ER, VR technology will soon be available for underwater shots, or is that too small of an industry to be relevant and in development? Underwater stuff is definitely happening, and more of it, especially with Avatar coming out, more of it is going to happen for sure. This concludes our chat. I hope you guys enjoyed it and, and had as much fun as Elijah and I have had talking, uh, because we can't see you, but you can see us. We've had a blast. Hope you've had a blast. So on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank everybody on here for coming here, listening to us. And thank you, Elijah, for sharing your experience, your process, your craft with all your fellow performers. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for taking the time. And I hope this was, was helpful in, in any way. And Zoriana, thank you for so much for, for hosting and moderating and facilitating this. All right, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs>